So I'm um, really excited to be here with you guys today for a critical examination of the small launch industry. Um, I wanted to start out by talking a little bit about the industry overall. Right now, um, my firm Space Fund is currently tracking 120 commercial launch companies. Um, those, of those companies, 60 of them are here in the United States, um, but you're starting, starting to see some real international movements with uh, rocket companies, launch companies uh, popping up all over the world lately. And, um, you know, a couple, couple of different types of um, technologies being used. Most of them are rockets, though. And um, by um, classification, how, how much can be launched? Uh, we've only got one person working on Super Heavy. That's, of course, SpaceX. Um, and 96 small launch companies. Um, so of those 90, or of, of the complete 120, uh, so far, only two companies have made it to orbit. Um, so it's going to be an interesting, uh, an interesting couple years as this industry shakes out. Um, and our lovely panelists are going to give us a little bit more information about that. So let's start with uh, some introductions. This is Kurt Blake from Space Flight Services. Um, and I'll let you, if you want to, talk about the video. And then you can tell us a little bit about yourself. I forgot I provided one. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, I'll wait till it's over. <laughs> So that's um, space flight. We've, as you can see, we've done a whole bunch of missions on a whole bunch of different launch vehicles. Um, we basically buy up excess capacity on those vehicles, um, aggregate those with a lot of um, customers that we have for small satellites, and then get them launched. We are, in essence, a freight forwarder to space. We try to make the experience super seamless for our customers. So just like if you want to you know, ship something from here to Australia, you don't really care what launch vehicle you're using or what, what's, what airline you're using, what airplane it happens to be, what truck it is or make of truck it is that takes it from you know, here to the airport and conversely from the airport back to, the, uh, to whatever the destination is. You don't care about the customs issues, you don't care about the ITAR issues, you just want it to happen. You want to have your satellite in space when you want it there and that's what we endeavor to do. So that's really, um, in essence, what Spaceflight does. We're uh, customers of all these gentlemen um, and uh, hope to win everybody's business that has a satellite to launch. Next up, uh, Grant Bonin, who is Chief Engineer of Space Systems at Rocket Lab. Go ahead and let us know what you're doing. Well, thanks, Megan. Uh, I was not offered the opportunity to upload a video. <laughs> so there you go. But we'll leave that alone for now. <laughs> so my name is Grant, um, the Chief Engineer for Space Systems at Rocket Lab. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with Rocket Lab, it's a company that was founded I guess, in 2006 uh, uh, in New Zealand by Peter Beck, um, a company that's been privileged enough to be launching a dedicated small satellite launcher right now from New Zealand and shortly from the continental United States as well, with 35 spacecraft successfully delivered to orbit to date. Uh, Rocket Lab is a venture-backed company that has raised a total of $288 million 
dollars to date and is a space unicorn. And really what we're working towards is a one-stop shop, soup to nuts solution for people's space missions. We've been flying our Electron small satellite launcher successfully seven times now. And right now what I'm uh, getting the privilege of running is our uh, expansion to space systems. Um, I'll butcher that Highland quotation that if you're uh, if you can get to Earth orbit, you're halfway to anywhere in the solar system. Well, we're starting to think about the rest of the solar system right now. So recently at the Colorado Space Symposium, we announced uh, a next program that we're doing that we call the Photon Small Spacecraft Platform, which has been architected to work together with our launch vehicle and taken together as a bundled offering comprise a one-stop launch plus space segment solution for customers so they can hyper-focus on the thing that's actually going to make them money, which is their payload, and we will take care of the rest. And so that's Rocket Lab in a nutshell. Next up, Eric Salwin um, from Firefly. Go ahead and uh, let us know what you're doing. Hi. So Firefly is a vertically integrated cislunar transportation company. And what we're doing is we're creating a family of launch vehicles and space vehicles that will service from LEO to the surface of the moon. We're starting with our Alpha launch vehicle, which is a pretty advanced state of development right now. We're chasing Rocket Lab pretty hard. We're hoping <laughs> that we're going to get Alpha up in the air on December 16th this year. So we have about 225 people in the U.S. that are working on this project. Um, we've completed a 300 second hot fire of our second stage, so that was an integrated second stage. We're working on our first stage development and then we're gonna start working on building the flight vehicle. Down the road, we have a beta launch vehicle that we're gonna work on, and that will give us the ability to do Constellation class launch. In conjunction with that, if you guys saw the news or if you didn't, we are part of the CLIPS program. So we've been selected as one of the nine companies that will potentially deliver payload to the surface of the moon, and we have a, um, a partnership agreement with IAI Aerospace to use the Bearsheet Lander IP to build a US version of the Bearsheet Lander. So that will um, give us a Genesis Lander. So with our beta and our Genesis Lander, we'll be able to deliver payload to the surface of the moon. And then down the road, we're working on, we like to work on a very cool autonomous horizontal takeoff and landing vehicle called Gamma. And everything is on our website at firefly.com and go check it out and I'm happy to be here and look forward to the panel with the rest of this group. Excellent, thank you. All right, JR, um, talk to us a little bit about Relativity Space. Well, thank you, Megan. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, JR Francis uh, from Relativity Space. I just want to start by piggybacking on Grant's comment. Was there was some communication amongst the panelists about using a video, um, and we all collectively agreed not to use a video, but since Kurt's a customer, it's a very um, <laughs> customer's always right, so we don't have any issues with that. And, and it was a cool video, too. It was a great and, video. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a little bit about Relativity Space for those of you that don't know. Uh, it was founded by Tim Ellis and Jordan Noon uh, about three, three or four years back. Um, we are developing the world's first autonomous rocket factory. Uh, at the center of that rocket factory is the world's largest uh, metal 3D printer called, called Stargate. Uh, it's developing our Terran 1 rocket, uh, which has the capability to deliver about 1,250 kilograms uh, to LEO orbit from our launch site in the Cape, LC-16 and about 900 kilograms to a, a polar orbit. Um, we've raised uh, about 40 million to date, uh, out raising Series C fundraising as we speak. Um, just cracked 96 employees, I think this week. Uh, to put that in perspective, about uh, a little over a year ago, we were at 14 employees, so I've seen tremendous growth over the last 12 to 15 months. Um, as I said, we've, uh, we've got a launch site uh, right of entry at LC-16 at the Cape, uh, working on the final stages of developing a launch capability for polar orbits as well. Um, some of you might have seen that we just uh, expanding our infrastructure as well. We've uh, signed a 200,000-square-foot uh, 200 square foot facility outside of Stennis to do uh, first, first stage integration and printing. And uh, we're looking to secure a, a headquarters outside of LA as well, which will be another 200,000-square-foot uh, facility, 200, foot facility uh, in, in LA. So again, I uh, look forward to the panel and uh, welcome any questions. Great. All right, let's get this. There we go. We can remember who everybody is. All right, so um, what do you guys see as, uh, you know, obviously these, there's a lot of launch companies. You guys are, are going after similar markets. Um, what do you see as the key differentiator for your business um, that's going to help you be successful? Anyway. 
so initially at Firefly, we um, started as Firefly Space Systems, and there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the crowd. Uh, raising money is hard. So Firefly Space Systems, at the time that we started it, we were working on a 400 kilogram to Leo vehicle. We ran out of money and shut down, and in the process of restarting, we took a look at the market and we saw that the payloads were getting larger and the capability that was needed uh, needed to grow. So when we came back with Firefly Aerospace, we came back with a thousand kilogram to Leo vehicle, which we feel for the small launch vehicle hits the perfect part of the market. So we could do aggregated payload missions for, you know, like for Kurt, he can aggregate 630 kilograms, put it up to SSO. If you're looking at a one web class satellite, you could put three of those onto a Firefly Alpha and then you can mix and match those missions. We also have a roadmap to the future that we think is going to be critically important for us. Our beta vehicle is going to be able to give us that Constellation class deployment ability. So then we could put up 20 to 30 one web class satellites and now we could bring that Constellation class launch back to the US. I mean, SpaceX can do it, but they potentially are not going to be launching a lot of one web satellites. So we think that's something that we'll be able to help out with. Yeah, sure, so I'll, I'll take a crack at that one. So in terms of differentiators, we're very fortunate right now. Um, the best ability is availability and electrons flying right now, which is not an advantage that will exist in perpetuity. So we want to take advantage of it now and not rest on our laurels. And it's really why we've moved into, I guess, a new phase of our existence where we're trying to bundle both launch spacecraft and also mission, mission operations as a service to become that one-stop shop for anybody's space mission in whichever way it makes sense for them. Um, I don't entirely uh, see, I guess, the, the economics the same way. We think that um, our economics are fundamentally a function of flight rate and high cadence, and bigger vehicles fly less often. They're harder to fill up. So we feel that we've found a segment of the market that can support high flight rate, good amortization of our fixed and operating costs, and therefore allow us to be responsive and offer very competitive pricing to our customers. And I guess the, the last thing to say about differentiation from our standpoint is that with our own privately owned um, launch complex in the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand, a second launch site coming online in Wallops towards the end of this calendar year, we're going to be able to support a higher flight rate than any other vehicle that's currently servicing the market and do really for a given customer, a given application, whatever makes sense. If that's launch, if it's rideshare, our, our most recent flight was for space flight services and that makes sense, then away we go. If it's selling somebody a spacecraft platform and operating it for them and providing the launch as well, we'll do that too. And it's about that flexibility and configurability for us. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. I think obviously our, our differentiator, our competitive advantage that we see is you know, our manufacturing uh, capability in, in, centered around uh, th 3D printing. Uh, we have, a, we have a, a mantra that once we, once we formalize our operational process that we can go from raw material to flight in less than 60 days. And so that's obviously resonating with uh, a lot of the constellation providers and allowing them to trade, you know, having ground, you know, utilizing ground spares or deployment in, in orbit spares. If they have that capability that they can, you know, have, a, have a, a, a satellite sitting on the ground and if and when they have a failure, they can deploy it to the specific orbit in, in roughly, roughly 90 days. So I think that's a, that's a competitive advantage that, that, uh, that, that, we're, that we're targeting. Ours is, um, is, is actually very different. It's a different business. Um, so we don't have our own launch vehicle. We use these guys and other folks. Um, and what we see is that launch vehicles over time are subject to delays. You know, they have technical problems, production problems, whatever, uh, or worse. And what we try to do is be the layer between the launch vehicle and the customer so that if the launch vehicle has difficulties, if the satellite's delayed, in being ready for the launch, we can basically take them and move them to a different launch vehicle, charge them a change fee for it, and then backfill that capacity with another customer because we do enough volume to do that. Uh, by doing that, we sort of smooth out the ripples in the, within the whole launch industry and provide kind of a needed service that keeps the launch vehicles whole. They're making all the money um, because by filling up their capacity. Makes the customers happy because if there's de a delay, they'll get up on orbit, you know, in time, and can can continue to make revenue from the satellites that they're launching. 
Um, and overall, make, and the new customer then gets basically a subsidized spot, partially subsidized spot, on, uh, on the launch vehicle space that was, that was uh, vacated. So that's a, that is a very different, obviously, model than what these gentlemen do, but that's, that's the differentiator. Excellent. So um, let's kind of take this the opposite way. What's the biggest threat to your business model? Mm. Yep. The customers disappear. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I, I think the, you know, the biggest threat from, from, from our standpoint is someone would come in with a, you know, could 3D print a rocket quicker than, than we could or had a, you know, a, a technology that could support our customers in a better way than, than, than we could. But, you know, I, I think in general, I, you know, I think we're all here because there, we feel that there's a real market and uh, the customer demand. You know, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of negative, sometimes negative press associated with the 117 odd launch companies that are out there and all the new space communities and how many will survive and, well, you know, how many won't survive. But I think it's what's what's more interesting is you say what's, you know, how do you look at how do you envision the the you know, our industry in 10 years? Um, what, what's it going to look like? And I think all of these companies, whether it's 117 launch companies or all the they're just pushing innovation and trying to increase technology and increase access to space. And I think what What's important is how can we, you know, how can we leverage the technologies and the best practice as a group, so that you know, in the end, our end customers are, you know, having uh, increased access to space and, and at the right price. From my standpoint, it's um, it's if there's orbital debris at a large scale. So if there ends up being some accidents in space where satellites are colliding or or they're shot down or whatever, then clearly getting to space becomes a, a difficult thing which would put us out of business. So I think that's kind of what I see as the biggest threat. And I think, you know, we're working on that as a, as a country and a, as a world um, to put basically space traffic management in place because you can imagine what, you know, the airline industry would look like today if there was no air traffic control. It would have sort of got to a certain point. Planes would have started running into each other. That probably would have you know, diminish demand a slight bit. And uh, so I think that's, that's sort of what I see as the biggest threat. So I think um, from our standpoint, aside from the risks of either market failure or technology failure, I think a concern that we have is whether the pace of regulation and the regulatory bodies can keep up with <laughs> the flight cadence that we're working to achieve. Right now we do produce a full vehicle per month. Um, our first launch complex in Mahia alone is licensed to fly to support launch once every 72 hours. The demand continues to ramp up on us, but the ability to go from order to orbit in a very short period of time for our customers is fundamentally um, a strong function of licensure, and they're very vulnerable to licensure delays. Now, we and, and we recognize other people's work in this area, of course, work very proactively with the FAA um, and other regulators to make sure that these processes are streamlined and we're seeing a lot of progress in those areas in particular right now, but I'd say that would be a thing that could be the rate limiting step for us as we scale and fly increasingly often. Yeah. And I, I'd say our biggest threat is that we don't execute our plan. This is an extremely competitive environment. We need to get to space. So the people that get there first, like Rocket Lab, start to capture market share that's gonna be very hard to rest from them. So that's why we're driving very hard to get to space this year so that we can go out there and start capturing market. And once we do that, we feel that we're gonna be successful. If we're on the ground, we're not gonna be successful. So that, that it's imperative to us to succeed. So um, the industry seems in, in danger of being oversupplied in the, in the near future. Um, if everybody's plans go as they should, and, you know, even if only a few of you um, are successful. So is there, is there a bubble? Is it going to burst? And um, if so, is this industry consolidatable, right? Um, can, are, are companies going to be purchased? Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on the bubble and the burst? It's a bubble. <laughs> we, we, we think that it is a bubble. We think that when the dust settles, there'll be room for a handful of successful companies, and they'll be differentiated across payload size and the specifics of their offerings to a reasonable degree. But the, 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 the demand is not there to support the number of entrants that we see in this space, despite how cool a lot of their concepts might be. Um, 
And of course, we think of it, as I mentioned before, as a bit of an extreme value problem where the largest launch vehicles you could conceive of, while cool, aren't going to fly often. The smallest ones become impractical or unable to loft useful payloads for useful customers. So the ones that we think will be left standing will be the ones that are in the middle, more biased towards the small size. And then I think to the question of whether it's consolidatable, uh, the hot take would be no. Uh, a lot of these companies, I think, are, are oil and water compared to each other. They have such fundamentally different technologies, fundamentally different people uh, and personalities and investor types. Um, I just think, unfortunately, a lot of them are, gonna, are, are not going to make it. But so it goes when you're exploring a new market like this. And um, you know, we do wish everybody success. Um, but I do think it's a bubble that's going to pop and might poison the risk capital for new launch for some time. And, and to an extent, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, this is very much like any other market. If you looked at the internet when it first started, many, many companies came out and had great ideas for the internet. Certain companies executed. You have your Amazons, and a lot of other companies didn't get there. So launch is going to be incredibly lucrative for the companies that succeed, and that's why you have 120 companies chasing after it. But it's extremely capital intensive. We've spent over $100 million on the project so far. So that's what it takes to build a Firefly Alpha class vehicle. You're going to have to go out there and raise $100 million. You're going to have to go out there and build a pretty large team. And then you're going to have to execute on a, a pretty tight timeline. And that is, that's going to thin the crowd pretty well. And then there will be a variety of companies that are left at the end. And there needs to be, because just like Kurt said, people are going to have anomalies. People are going to hit slow points. You have to be able, if we're going to have a healthy market, to move um, payloads from vehicle to vehicle. And by doing that, you're going to assure people they can get to space. And if they have a business plan that depends on them being on orbit, then they'll be able to close their business plan with the assurance that there is going to be a vehicle out there that's going to get them to space. I, mean, I think, I think we, we all got asked this question in, over and over again on the variety of different panels. And I, I think there, we can certainly all agree that there is going to be some amount of contraction and consolidation in the industry when a certain number of customers uh, will in, inevitably fail. Um, but I think, again, to my point earlier, it's like I, I, I think it's generally good for the industry and good for the customer base that there's you know, these hundred and hundred odd companies out there innovating on the launch vehicle side and on the, on the satellite side. Um, because you know, I think if you, if you take a look back at where we were 15 or 20 years ago in the industry, there, may, there probably was two or three different commercial viable um, launch companies and uh, the satellite operators, you know, they would they would um, build a 200 to 300 million dollar satellite that was designed for 15 was designed for 15 years and you know some some portions of that market still exist but right now you could look and say there's you know nine or ten commercially viable launch companies now and some some companies even legacy legacy uh, satellite operators are, are designing satellites that you know for all intents and purposes are, are disposable in lifetimes of seven to ten years and in some cases are and in some of the, the CubeSats are, are disposable so the model is changing I think it's tied to you know the innovation that we're seeing and hopefully continue to see over you know over the over the, um, the next five to ten years assuming the bubble doesn't pop before <laughs> all right give me a number how many companies you think are going to survive probably high single digits. To, I mean, small. we're talking about small companies, not the ones small that are already there. Ones, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it'll get out of the high single digits. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So of the 96 small launchers, you think eight or nine will survive? Is that what we're saying? 10%? Yeah. All right. Um, so where do you see the industry in 10 years? It's going to be cool, man. <laughs> it, it will be. There's, there's going to be a ton of vehicles. I mean, there's just... We're building the infrastructure to space. We're going to allow people to go out there and have these crazy ideas and put them on orbit. And then, and then this whole cislunar economy is really going to expand in ways that we can't even predict right now. The same way that when the iPhone came out and you're looking at it and they're like, oh, these apps are cool. And everybody's like, what's an app? There's going to be apps on orbit. There's going to be things that people create that we really can't imagine right now. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think, um, personally, anyway, I, I, you don't have to look too far into the past to have seen a world where 
our future in space and our activities, our activities in space depended on the choices that a couple billionaires in four countries made. And one of the reasons that I got into small spacecraft development in the first place and, and small launch now as well is to create space programs for the rest of us. So fast forward 10 years, I have a very optimistic vision of what that's going to look like. I think it's going to look like a larger number of smaller spacecraft doing extremely high value missions for real customers throughout cislunar space. Um, and that's really what got me excited in the very first place and in getting into this industry. And we're starting to see that come to fruition. There'll be some of the mega constellations will fail. We talked about the launch vehicle uh, consolidation or contraction, but by and large, I see the activity uh, in low Earth orbit and beyond only increasing, enabled by a larger number of smaller uh, players. That's my take. Yeah, but I think we all agree. I think you can envision in 10 years, you can, you know, be potentially people and infrastructure on the moon, maybe coming back and forth from the moon, um, and same way, in, you know, bridging that, bridging that gap to, to Mars as well. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I highlighted when I started, but our, our, our vision, uh, the company was founded on being able to, to print the, the first um, rocket from Mars. So, so you can, you know, our goal in, in 10 years, our long-term goal was to have some sort of small prototype Stargate, miniature Stargate that's, uh, that's on Mars and printing some sort of uh, test component. So that's, that's in our 10-year our plan. It's lofty, but that's, you know, that's, how we, that's how we envision the market uh, potentially being in, in 10 years. Yeah, and clearly as, as the supply of launch vehicle capacity goes up, um, you know, that, it, that creates a whole bunch of different opportunities for people mm -hmm. to come up with new ideas that are relying on a cheaper rate. Wow. <laughs> supply and demand. There you right. go. New ideas. <laughs> Excellent. So um, when it, let's talk a little bit about price. Typically in a situation where there is a lot of supply, you see a, you see a significant downward pressure on price. So um, do you guys have room in your business model for, for those launch prices to go down? Can you still be, be profitable if the competition uh, becomes a price war? We can because we're sort of in the know, middle. In the middle. Yeah. Um, I thought you were going to ask, like, what's the per kilogram rate that's going right now or something like that. But um, yeah, we can survive well, through, we can you know, when, was, when it was what super you... high as it's, you know, it's, it's starting to come down now. But right today, uh, today, speaking of sort of out through mid-20, um, there's way more demand than supply, um, way more. And that's an issue and it's a hard one to, to try to solve. So that's the current state of things. Maybe in the second half of 20, there'll start to be some catch up there, but right now there certainly isn't. Any comments? I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, we, <laughs> I think we, we, our Terran 1 rocket right now for a full, full dedicated mission is, is $10 million. So that's for that 1,250 kilograms to, to Leo from the Cape or the 900 kilograms to a, a polar orbit, and we think that's that's um, that's pretty you know pretty competitive competitively priced um, in in the market. And we, you know we we would also think that our vehicle um, is competitively priced. We're 15 million dollars, so again, that's why we have to get to space and start capturing market share because there are going to be other companies that come along that are going to advertise a, a, a lower price. And that's going to create competition and downward pressure. But we have pretty healthy profit margins, so I, I think we're going to be okay. So what's the biggest opportunity in the launch market that you're surprised nobody's talking about? So the, I think it's, at least from our perspective, it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit what we already said. And I don't think it's that anybody's not talking about it, but I think some people put it by the wayside. It's, for us, it's... Um, consolidating the launch segment, space segment, and mission operations into a single service and flying as much as we possibly can. Frequent flight is the core, um, the core thing that launch companies need to achieve for their economics to make sense, to realize meaningful price reductions, everything in between. And what we see in this space, I think, and it does still surprise me, is a lot of people who become enamored with a particular technology or implement, an implementation decision on the engineering side, but they're not hyper-focused on their economics or how their economics are going to play out or what is going to happen if we enter a regime of elasticity that doesn't exist in launch right now. And that's about flight rate, and the only way to achieve the <laughs> highest flight rate is to make the experience for the customer as simple as possible, which means being a one-stop shop. Uh, I, I think 
it's it's a pretty well traveled um, question. I think one of the, some of the things that we're doing, which which are cool, is the orbital transfer vehicle. So that's an in space propulsion vehicle, and other people are working on that. But we think it's going to really uh, give people more options for on orbit missions. So we'll be able to deploy satellites off of that, to drop them off in different orbits. And then with the electric propulsion, it can actually do longer missions. It can get to lunar orbit. We can do small geo missions for it. So we think that is going to open people up to different missions that they can fly. Um, from our standpoint, I think the biggest opportunity right now is the um, is GTO missions. There's We did the um, Space IL lunar mission um, back in March or February. Uh, and also deployed a, another uh, a satellite to GEO. So we're seeing a big uptick in demand for those, those types of missions. So I think that's um, moving from LEO, not moving from, adding um, GTO and GEO and what these guys talked about going to the moon and, and wherever from there uh, definitely is becoming uh, an increasing part of our business. So. And um, aside from the mega constellations, where do you see um, future demand coming from for launch services? What are, the, what are the cool things that are coming down the pike that you guys are going to be launching that's, uh, besides the constellations? Well, for us, besides the mega constellations, there's probably like 40 kind of moderate sized constellations, you know, 60 and below um, satellites, maybe a little more than that. And, uh, we're, I think we've, we are launching or have launched for probably 35 or 36 of those. So I think that's, those sorts of repeat customers are really key to our business. It's something we really look to because um, if we do a good job for them, and we can get them up on orbit um, in a timely way. And if we solve problems that would have been difficult for them to solve had they gone direct to a, a specific launch vehicle, like a problem occurred, like the, the Vega, you know, recently. But we, we've definitely, in, in our seven years of existence, have encountered other anomalies and had to move people around between um, different launch vehicles. And I think when, whenever we do that, it's difficult, it's hard to do, but it really proves the value add, and it's really compelling to those Constellation providers. I think, um, kind of echoing that, the um, the concern about hitching yourself to one customer, um, I'm sure people in this room have experienced that before. Um, having a large number of diverse customers and a balanced manifest that can engage kind of in equal parts or in whatever parts make sense, defense and civil and commercial, is really going to be that key because I wouldn't want to, wouldn't want one, uh, one company to hitch themselves to one contract or one customer and then have that all pop on you. I think to, to Grant's point, I think differentiation uh, is key. So I, mean, I think the mega, mega constellations are really populating the demand and generating this bubble for you know an, an interest in in the launch community in general. But there you know there are a handful of, of Earth observation constellations that are out there as well um, that aren't focused necessarily on the communication. There's government, U.S. government's going to play a, a big role um, and has played a big role in 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 all of our in all of our uh, launch requirements and, and international markets as well. I think. Uh, will we'll play will play a, play a key role as well as NASA and civil missions. I think they're you know I think eventually once once some of these constellations prove out and become operational, then there'll be the resupply and then there'll be the you know the deployment of the constellation redeployment of the constellations that are operational, and then I think that ecosystem starts to evolve to you know the the outside of Leo missions to it, it could be Leo and it could be it could be Mars. I think it, you know once once the once the, the, some of these constellations come to fruition, I think it'll really start to pave the way for other companies to start you know. Deploying different technologies to, to other other parts of other parts of uh, outside of Leo. And, I, and there, just like Kurt said, beyond the mega constellations, initially our target would be the smaller constellations. They need to get them up five, ten at a time, and then they're going to need to continually replenish. Every every five years, they're going to be in in that five year cycle. Every year or two, they're going to be doing launches. So we're looking forward to that and. Honestly, I get to talk to a lot of interesting people that want to put stuff on orbit, and I, you know, can't really talk about a lot of it. But like, if you look and you and you read about what people are trying to do, like Cloud Constellation, they're going to build um, 
you know, a, an orbital data center. So there's going to there's going to be things like that 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 come around and come up that are going to be interesting that don't necessarily need thousands of satellites that might need ten or twenty that are going to be good opportunities for us on the smaller side. So um, there's talk of several different types of. Uh, of alternatives to chemical rockets um, for getting things into space. Some of those are kind of very high G scenarios, right? Um, <laughs> do you guys feel that that group is, um, is at all a threat to, to your market and what you're doing? So we wish everybody that has a great idea success, and we're just, we're focused on doing Honestly, we're focused on doing what we're doing. So we have our technology. We are going to get it on orbit. If the if people can figure out how to how to do these very high G technologies, it's gonna it's gonna be interesting. It'll open up some other some other technologies for people. Yeah, I think um, kind of similar to, to what Eric said. We're we're in the headspace of running our own race. Um, good customers. We've got to launch. There are technical challenges with every approach to launch. The more alternative they are, typically, and the more they are at the edge of their solution space, the harder it's typically going to be. Um, so, you know, we're just we're focused on doing our thing, and we think that in the long run, a lot of the more radical concepts will thin out. Though, who knows? We'll see what happens. Uh, the more the more launch capacity there is, and the more people can get launched, uh, and the more diversity of approaches there are. That's the the net benefit of the customers we're trying to serve. So. Good, good. Um, what advice would you give to uh, the other hundred companies um, as they're getting started? Don't do it! <laughs> <laughs> you consider uh, it, a different business. <laughs> it, it, it's hard. I mean, you, you, you have to really go into it with a good plan, a good team, good financing, uh, and then just work super hard for a long time. So if, if you don't have a lot of that up front, you're going to have a very hard time with it. And, and I'm not, I'm really don't, I'm not going to say don't do it because it, it is, I mean, it, it is going to be uh, a very interesting next 10 years. So I mean, hope, hopefully people can come up with great concepts and execute. Uh, getting to space is Really, really hard, as we all know, and really, really expensive. But uh, you know, I think you know, Rocket Lab and Grant showed that it showed it's possible. So it kind of paved the way for for the rest of us. So there, there is a there is an opportunity out there. But you know, I I think I'll, I'll just say I'm I'm fortunate enough to to work for uh, a company and an entrepreneur that that outlined a disruptive technology. And I think that's the only advice that that, that I would give is is to is to find a disruptive technology that you think you can build a customer base around, uh, deliver on, on, that, uh, on that technology, be disruptive, make it, make it your passion, and then you know, continue, to, continue to innovate, continue to innovate around, uh, around your customer base. I mean, that's it. Find a disruptive technology that, uh, that a certain customer set can, can leverage. Okay. So, um, and some of you touched on this a little bit, but What's the total amount of money that you're going to need to raise um, to become operational? To, to hit revenue, how about that, let's say? Yeah, so we're, we're in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> well, give us the number again. So well, we raised, uh, we raised uh, $288 million, um, to date in um, equity financing for Rocket Lab. Um, the most recent uh, was a Series E last year, which I think was $140 million. And as our, as our CFO said before, there's still a lot of powder left in that keg. So um, we're in good shape with working capital and <laughs> revenue generation. We're well on our way. <laughs> uh, we, raised, we raised $40 million, uh, to date, uh, Series B fundraise. Um, and, and Tim's out in the process right now um, uh, to, to raise our, raise our Series C. So we're in the process of doing that as we speak. And, and we've spent over $100 million. Um, we're fortunate that we have financing through our first launch, and we might go out and raise additional capital to do things like build our, our beta vehicle, but it's, it's expensive. <laughs> it's not relevant. <laughs> I, we started with 5,000. Excellent, excellent, good job, good job. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the way to do it. <laughs> um, fantastic. So what's your exit strategy? To take over the world. <laughs> hmm. 
I mean, all, all, these, all these investors giving you millions of dollars but must, uh, must want one of those in the future at some point, right? So what's, what's the strategy? I think everybody, everybody, has, everybody identifies the same handful of exit opportunities down the road for them. So there's, there's no new information that I think we can add to that, um, except that also from our standpoint, we're, we're going to do whatever makes sense as long as we can continue to build value. Um, there are a lot of companies that um, get acquired not because they're great, but because they're broken in some way. If you see a car on the side of the road that says for sale on it, you don't usually say, hey, that car looks great. Right? You ask yourself what's wrong with it. Um, but um, yeah, I think everybody has the same fundamental answers to those questions. And it's a read and react kind of situation a lot of the time. Well, if, um, if as we mentioned earlier, the industry is not consolidatable, um, that kind of uh, it means there might not be the type of M&A action you would normally see in an industry that's growing this size. So um, SpaceX has said they're not going to IPO till they land on Mars, so I'm hoping one of you guys will get that figured out first <laughs> because that might be some time for them. So, um, so that's great. Um, what, what comes next? Let's talk, you know, SpaceX is, um, is launching Starlink, Blue Origins launching Kuiper. They're kind of using their, their own excess capacity to to launch a uh, you know to, to launch these um, these other projects um, what do you guys see as kind of that that next fun thing that you're going to be able to use your launch capacity to do yeah I mean I, I think there's there, there's a medium and a long-term vision at, at relativity the, the medium the medium term vision is to is to uh, firm out the design and, and make Terran one operational and then as I alluded to earlier the the longer term vision is is to is to embark on the on the strategy of you know creating a a 3D printed part uh, on Mars. So I think longer term vision being 10 years out. If Tim was up here, that that's what he would say. He would say, I'd, you know, I'd vision having a a prototype Stargate 3D printer that was deployed to Mars. Maybe not on our capacity. Maybe it's a maybe it's a BFR. Maybe it's a New Glenn. But we you know, we we purchase that and they launch a prototype uh, a prototype 3D printer to Mars and we you know we build the, the first component that was. That was made from Mars. So I think that's that's not that's what we envision. It's not like next, but it's not necessarily tied to our capacity, but it's tied to our you know our platform. That's that's at the at the heart of our overall strategy. Say, uh, yeah. I guess uh, stay tuned. <laughs> we'll we'll talk about it when we're close to doing it or have already done it. Yeah, I, I think for us it's to deliver payload to the surface of the moon. I mean, for for me being here yesterday and we went to the reception at the, the flight museum and we showed up and the Apollo capsule is there and I'm sitting there looking at it and I'm thinking wow we just made this deal to build this lander and we're part of the clips program and there's going to be some day not too far in the future that Firefly is going to be delivering cargo to the moon so I mean that 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 excites me I mean we're, we're gonna have to do a lot of work in between now and then but we see it so we have just um, just a few minutes left on the panel. I wanted to throw it open and see if there's anything that um, that you guys want to talk about that questions that I didn't ask or questions that you don't get asked or um, if there's one more plug for your company to, to make you look good, um, you have, take a minute to do that. No, nothing. No last words. I would, I would take this opportunity to play my video, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> really, really sorry about that. Uh -huh. I mean, <laughs> see how it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. Are there any questions from the audience? Hi. Sorry, jumped the gun a little on that. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here today, all of you. Um, I had a, a question, uh, mostly for three of you on the right. Um, are you concerned <clears throat> at all that um, Chinese small launchers will? take away some of your customer base because they will undercut your price per kilogram. Um, even taking into consideration um, the increased risk of flying on a Chinese small launch vehicle or perhaps in perceived increased risk, do you think that there's any danger of them taking away some of your customer base? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll say I think they're, they're obviously a viable competitor. Um, there's, there's certain restrictions and limitations to utilizing that. Um, their, their rockets, but they, they are a they are a viable competitor. But that being said, I think the system that we devi that we developed, we, we feel that we are we are competitive um, with, in, in that market with uh, with the Chinese vehicles as well. Though I think that the key <clears throat> when you talk about a 
the launch company's total addressable market. I think the key word there is addressable. And there are a lot of, there's a lot of business that I think a lot of us engage in that would be impractical for a Chinese competitor to meaningfully engage. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So um, I have a question about, since you rocket experts and understand the economics of the system very well, do you believe that reusability is a key to success in rocketry, or um, is there, can it be done in other ways, like with low-cost manufacturing, or is it just an overblown uh, story that um, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos like to use a lot? I, I'm, I'm a strong proponent in reusability. I mean, I think we have to start by getting to space first. And once you prove that you have that orbital capability, then you move forward and you go towards reusability. So if we look at, if you go on our website and you look at our gamma, that's our entry into the reusability. And we feel that that's going to be a great vehicle that is going to offer um, fully reusable first stage. I think you have to, at least from our perspective, I think you have to tackle flight rate as the first and foremost problem. A fully, a fully reusable vehicle that doesn't enjoy great capital utilization is not going to be a great vehicle. You have to fly often for that to make sense. In the limiting sense, if you have an extremely high flight rate, then you can start to, um, I guess, asymptotically approach your marginal cost. And then it can make sense to try to take bites out of that marginal cost, depending on how expensive it is for you to actually build one more vehicle. But to f the first and most important thing from, I think, our standpoint would be rapidity and frequency. Yeah, I think, I'll just add, I think the, the economics of reusability are, are different depending on the price point and the size of the rocket. So it's, as you, smaller rockets, reusability, depending on your flight rate and your, and your price, it may or may not make sense. But as you get into the larger rockets, it certainly, it certainly makes, a, it makes, makes a, the economics work out a little bit better. And again, your flight rate goes down. Once your flight rate goes down, you know, the, reuse, the, the value of reusability certainly goes up. I think that um, the, the low-hanging fruit is really filling up all the available capacity you have on a launch. I think if half of it goes unused or, you know, 20% or 30% goes unused, then reusability is sort of an, uh, not really going to make a difference in that situation. And I think um, that's still a problem in the U.S., especially with U.S. government launches. Um, but if, I think that's the thing to tackle first. Then, you know, we've, we've flown on SpaceX launchers and stuff. Um, so far, we haven't seen a change in pricing based on the reusability. But, um, but that's yet to be seen. I'm sure it's coming down the road. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm just curious as to the sort of where you spend your money with respect to your financing. You have, um, you know, $100 million or $200 million that you spend. How's that broken out in terms of, you know, getting from point A to point B? So how much have you spent on research? How much is it that on prototype, uh, ground support development, uh, testing of the prototypes? Like, what's the breakdown in terms of, you know, going from point A to point B to actual launch? Uh, it, it, I mean, it's difficult to provide exact numbers, but if you look at it, so right now we have 225 people that are working on the project. Uh, you just look at the fully loaded cost of an FTE, that's a big chunk of the money right there is that 225 people. We have a 200 acre test site that we built from the ground up. Tens of millions of dollars have been invested in making that a world-class facility. Then you have to you know, develop the launch facility, or in our case, we were fortunate enough to be working on a slick too, so we need to upgrade that facility, and then you need to actually produce the, the vehicles. I'm curious, could you share your thoughts about the selection of a location for your launch, whether it would be continental United States or New Zealand, and what factors go into that? Is it geopolitical stability? Is it the economics, the mechanics? How did you select, and do you see a change in the future as the, uh, the frequency of launch goes up? Are people going to start to have a different view of having launches made from Vandenberg or Cape Canaveral versus New Zealand or other locations? Um, yeah, I can, I, can, I can start. I mean, our, we, we have right of entry to um, LC-16 at the Cape that was chosen um, uh, to, to service mid-inclination. So I think one of, the, one of the factors that go into developing a launch site is, you know, what orbits can they service? Um, so that was, that was for our, our mid-inclination capabilities. And then we'll, we'll, we'll certainly look to, to develop a polar site as well, which will probably be in, in, in the U.S. And, you know, I, I think 
you know, as, as demand increases globally, I think there's certainly, there's certainly a market to, to look at, at developing uh, launch sites in, you know, to service uh, foreign governments as well, uh, if, if it makes sense. But it's, it's primarily driven by the customer base that, 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 that you're looking at and the orbits that you want to service with your launch vehicle. I think you ticked all the boxes with your list. <laughs> They're all relevant. Um, Question over here. Um, you guys are all in general agreement that there is a real high demand right now for small launch vehicles. Now, with that being said, can you guys talk to the major hurdles each of your companies face over the next couple of years to meet that demand? Um, for example, more specifically for you, Grant, you mentioned that you have two launch sites. Well, one, the second's almost up and running. Uh, and that the complex is capable of supporting a launch every 72 hours. Uh, can you speak to your current production rate of your vehicle and what it would look like at its peak and when that would be? You know, I think we're really only I think we're really, really only heating up on production, but right now we're um, building a vehicle roughly one per month, which is um, a fantastic rate. Um, we're only looking to increase our production cadence. Uh, the challenge in front of us is to scale, to meet that demand. I think you identified it in the question. And that is um, that is where a lot of businesses hit the, um, the not very sexy but most significant uh, problems to solve. Um, a lot of companies fail when they try to move into more of a production mode and have to scale. And so we're extremely focused on doing that carefully and doing it right. And so far, it's scaling nicely, but there, there, there are challenges associated with yeah, production to meet demand ahead of us. Um, these are good problems to have, of course. It's better than the challenge of having no customers. So. Hey guys, um, as you grow your firms out, um, you know, as you start having more launches and uh, more you know, public vision, what are your efforts like for pushing for you know, more marketing and branding your companies, especially, you know, launch is sexy, you know, how do you connect with the public? Is that important or you just focus on, you know, customers? I, I think it's important. I think it's exciting. I think what SpaceX has done, like I, I was sitting on an airplane watching the Falcon Heavy and I was in France and I was on a metered thing and it cost me about a hundred bucks to watch that launch <laughs> and it, it was it was amazing and I, I just kept hitting re-up 50 more mags of data, 50 more mags of data. <laughs> and um, I, think it, I think it makes it exciting for everyone. And I think it, it especially when you're trying to encourage STEM, it, it, you know, people, people need to see that, need to, need to be a part of it. And I think Rocket Labs is also doing a great job with it. Social license to operate matters quite a bit. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think the, it's interesting. It's an interesting point because I think a lot of our businesses, or all, all of our businesses are, you know, B2C, business to consumer businesses, but there is, there is an important part of all of our you know, marketing branding efforts that are you know, business to the consumer and how they, how they, how they utilize, our, how, they, how they view our systems. And, and SpaceX did a great job of commercializing that and making it cool. And you know, everyone, I think there's a, license, there's a lot more people uh, the general, that aren't necessarily customers, just the general public that are in, interested in, in following every single launch now, which is, which is really cool. And so it's, it's a very important part of at least our, our focus and our, our, our marketing and branding strategy. And I would also say that uh, if IPO is the end result, right? That's an initial Sorry. public offering. So they do need to know who you are if they're going to buy your stock, right? right? Yeah. There you go. Uh, Eric, so you mentioned briefly that the expanding the size and capacity of your rockets is uh, becoming increasingly important as you're entering into the field again. Uh, to all of you, do you see increasing the capacity of your uh, launch vehicle to be increasingly important? And to Curtis, do you see that a, a larger launch vehicle is a drastic help to your launching abilities? Um, I'll take the, um, since you named me. <laughs> um, we, we've done a couple of Falcons and um, I think really that you can certainly do those and aggregate a whole bunch of, of uh, small satellites onto that um, for LEO, but that's a difficult proposition. I think you're, you're really better off taking a mid-size or a small-size rocket um, and ride-sharing that and making sure that you're using all the performance of that vehicle so you can bring the per kilogram price down to something meaningful. 
Um, for Geo, it's a different it's a different ball game because the performance is so different. So, but I think that for Geo that matters, and for going to you know Cislunar or other things, then I think absolutely a, a larger rocket is super helpful. Um, if you're going to Leo, I think that having a mid-sized rocket is just five five hundred to a thousand kilograms. Um, that's plenty to to for us to aggregate, put enough customers on there to make. You know, a nice mission that makes us some money, makes the launch vehicle provider some money, gets gets customers up there at an affordable price. And I, I, I think that we're in a different market than the SpaceX's and the Blue Origins. I think they have that pretty well covered, and we're aiming to cover the market below them. So we need our Alpha to do particular missions, and we need our Beta to do other larger missions. And we think that combination of the two is going to allow us to, to capture a good portion of the market. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, hi, uh, Luke Maloney here. I'll ask you guys a completely different sort of uh, domain question. Uh, since you guys are all targeting like high cadence launch and aggregation of lots of different satellites, I'm wondering if you guys have, have any role to play in the future sort of mitigation of the pending space debris problem because higher cadence launches is going to bring that problem closer to the present day. Well, I think, if this is, like I mentioned um, earlier, I think that um, having space traffic management is key. I mean, just as the, the same sort of issues as air traffic, I think you've got to make sure that if they're going to have that kind of high cadence, that that's something where you're not going to be you know, just risking a bunch of people colliding up there. Um, so I think that's important. And I think there's also a lot of innovative um, customers that are customers of ours that are coming up with innovative ideas on how to mitigate the space degree issue and, and basically clean some of that up. So I think, I think yes, there's, that's always a potential issue. And a higher um, launch rate, certainly all things equal, would contribute potentially to a problem. But that just really means we've got to look out for space traffic management and start coming up with solutions to some of those issues. Yeah, I, I think it's a shared responsibility. Um, you know, we have started looking at uh, deorbit modules that um, we could use to help deorbit our stages faster. Um, do you need to do additional burn? You know, how, how do you make sure that you leave the smallest footprint possible yeah. on orbit after your launches? And, and it, it is, it's critically important. Yeah, we, we put a sail on, um, if you remember from the video long back, uh, there's, there's a couple of, uh, of Sherpas that we used to deploy a whole bunch of spacecraft off. We actually, what didn't show is there was a sail that deployed after that that brought those two, the lower free flyer and the higher, and upper free flyer, down much more rapidly they would, than they would otherwise have gone. Excellent. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.